Ben Staples' show is hitting Netflix, and it marks the end of a years-long saga for an idea that Vince has been trying to get out there for four to five years. So what's the history behind this thing, and what can we expect from this new upcoming sitcom? What's up, y'all? I'm Devon here again for Obligatory. We do a weekly music news roundup on this channel every Friday. This Friday is uh, January 19th, 2024, and uh, join us every week for these. So the Netflix series that we are getting is a five-part miniseries about a day in the life of the Long Beach MC. Netflix says, who is Vince Staples? Well, that's a tricky question. He's kind of famous, but he's not. He's kind of rich, but he's not. And he's also kind of a criminal, but he's not? Follow him on his daily adventures where anything that can go wrong usually does. So this sounds like and looks like a pretty fun and simple idea for a show. I think Vince is going to be great. Maybe not all as straightforward as it seems. I think the tone and the atmosphere around the humor here makes it kind of akin to something like Donald Glover's Atlanta. Most of us already know Vince Staples is like a hilarious real life human being. Most underrated attraction in Long Beach. The county jail. Saying stuff just off the cuff that just goes to show his brain does not work like everybody else's. God's not a person. If God is a thing, he would be like a thing that don't have a face. But people say God is a person because people have egos. But. If you've seen him in Abbott Elementary, you know he's a pretty solid actor. He's been building a portfolio of appearing in shows or doing voiceovers. Now, as I mentioned before, this is not the first iteration of the Vince Staples show that we have seen on screen, and it first actually came up as a YouTube series that was seemingly integrated with some new releases, like an episode would come out, and it would be kind of, you know, not really an episode, but a skit or a scene integrated with a single that he would then release the same week. Episode one titled So What and episode two titled Sheet Music. And these are both the singles that were released by the same title. And so I was always pretty intrigued by this show because episode one, he like gets in an action fight scene in the barbershop. And then episode two there's like Ray J in it and he's monologuing and it's like, where is this going? This is nuts. And the, the songs themselves were pretty good as well. This time, it feels like there's no real word on any music or unreleased music making it into the show itself. In fact, the song that they used in the trailer kind of makes me feel like this is a separate entity from any potential new album or music he might want to drop later on. Whereas it felt like the first concept of this was to release an album that was translated into a show at the same time. Now, all this stuff was coming out towards the end of 2019. And so I always wondered if like the pandemic had anything to do with why this just went away and we never really heard much about it from there. And what do you think of the trailer? What are you expecting for the show moving forward? Were you like me and you'd been kind of waiting for more information on this, always wondering what happened to this show and maybe potentially an album as well? JPEG Mafia, known Twitter user, uh, went off on Kanye West in a series of tweets on Monday perplexed as to the reason why he doesn't get to be one of the 27 guys tweaking hi-hats for his upcoming album with Ty Dolla Sign. And as you can see from these tweets here, naturally, Peggy reasons that it's simply because he's, quote, not a rapist or some incel weirdo, which at this point, fair enough. Um, Pitchfork's parent company announced this week their plans to move the digital music publication under the GQ umbrella, and this was announced with a wave of layoffs to writers and contributors. Quote, Today, we are evolving our Pitchfork team structure by bringing the team into the GQ organization. This decision was made after a careful evaluation of Pitchfork's performance and what we believe is the best path forward for the brand so that our coverage of music can continue to thrive within the company. Now, a lot of people really don't give two dicks about Pitchfork and their shitty scores and their dude dad centric atmosphere, but they were still doing some very necessary and important work. There are many a talented writers under that publication. And as someone literally trying to make their way in a similar space as this, you know, it's admittedly been very scary to see so many layoffs at so many different companies and just the general downsizing of the entire industry around music media and journalism. It really wasn't all that long ago that Pitchfork represented the new era of music media, music criticism, album reviews, and it really provided a platform to so many influential projects and movements that truly define the 2010s across many genres. Now, as for Pitchfork and its content and the remaining staff and so on, what's happening there, I, I think we have a major wait and see approach to the situation. And I think there's going to be dominoes that continue to fall. You know, right now you can't just go and change everything. But I think this is the kind of move that signals that 
the heart, the soul, the vision of the company is going to go through changes and it's going to be passed through different hands. If you want my take on things, I think the future for this space is independent. I think it's working class content creation. And I think that it's going to be based more in social media than ever. People, individuals having their own platforms to connect with fans and provide communities and provide micro communities. Now, like I said, it's hard out there for the working class content creator. It's also really hard out there for the working class artist. But this story gives me a little bit more positive hope, I, I would say. Looking at rappers like Billy Woods and Elucid who combined to form the duo Arm & Hammer, they're showing us a really nice blueprint business model for great independent artists with really engaged fan bases because they are just now rounding off the release of 2023's We Buy Diabetic Test Strips and they're already pressing something new for fans, but it's not something that you're going to find on Spotify or Apple Music. In fact, I'm not even 100% sure you could buy this online. If you want to hear their upcoming Black Label project, you're going to have to go see them in concert. If you've been paying attention to them, you'll know this is something that they've done before. This is like a follow-up to White Label, which dropped in 2022. And, you know, under a similar premise, it had new and old unreleased material and some collabs. This time, JPEG Mafia, ASAP Rock, Sam I Am are headlining a long list of producers here. One specifically that stuck out to me is an OG version of the song Tupac Jackets from Known Unknowns 2017. It's a song that features Elucid and originally had a beat by Blockhead and in the track list here it says this is an OG version produced by ASAP Rock. I love ideas like this because there really should be some things just for your core fans and I think that goes for artists big and small because most artists have that core fan base that mess with everything that they do, ride or die, and then there are people that come and go with what they like, and that's just kind of what it is. But once your fans, like your real engaged fans, have established that they will spend money on you, I think you got to feed that and you got to supply that demand. But giving them a real reason to go to a show and to buy a vinyl, maybe if even they were already going to do that, I think is just good business practice for keeping engaged fans, especially when you already have engaged fans. I love stuff like this because a lot of the stories I end up talking about is how fucked up and bleak it is in the music business and in music media right now. But I've never felt more confident that there's a space for the working class artist that has a thousand true fans to really make and live well off of their art. One of the bigger story beats of the week was that Coachella's lineup was announced and multiple summer festival lineups were announced here in the dead of winter if you're living in the States. Coachella has Lana Del Rey, Tyler the Creator, and Doja Cat as headliners, and then some interesting ones to show up here, a blur, Deftones, No Doubt, all kind of making these little reunions. And then we got Governor's Ball, which takes place in New York, New York. They will host The Killers, who are doing a couple of these, SZA, 21 Savage, Peso Pluma, Love and Life Music Fest based in Charlotte, North Carolina is cooking up something wild with Post Malone, Stevie Nicks, and the baby headlining their set. So well, what do you want? We got it all here. Um, and then New Orleans Jazz Fest has a pretty jazz light headlining uh, group of the Rolling Stones, Foo Fighters, Anderson Pack, and the Free Nationals. I definitely would want to see that. Vampire Weekend and the Beach Boys and many more. Any of these interests, y'all? I mean, if you were throwing money and travel out of the window, which one would you pick to go to? I can't say I'm like incredibly blown away by any of these lineups. I'm like mildly intrigued by most of them. We also got ourselves another Playboy Cardi single this week. Um, it's another like unofficially released one. We've had two music videos officially released on the Playboy Cardi YouTube page. And then we've had several other songs come out with videos. Uh, none of these songs have been on streaming platforms. Cardi has been super consistent to start off 2024 for somebody who is very touch and go with details, snippets, music, all that stuff. I mean, it really does feel like something is coming and it's coming soon. And this track is probably my favorite of the five or six that I've heard so far. I love the super dirty beat on this. I love the DJ Swamp Izzo DJ drops over a lot of these tracks and if this is a project that ends up taking on like a kind of a raw mixtape feel to it, I think that's a theme that I could enjoy in a new Cardi album. I also wanted to give a huge shout out to Danny Brown and Bruiser Wolf for their new music video for YPB, which was off the Quaranta album, which dropped really late in 2023 by Danny Brown. Uh, this is a really cool music video that features some stop motion claymation, which is kind of a dying art form. It's definitely not the most efficient way to make a music video or to make a movie. 
Uh, it's a labor of love if you've ever seen what it really takes to make something like this. Now, the only difference is, is that they've taken like video shots of their faces rapping Danny Brown and Bruiser Wolf and put those over the claymation versions of themselves in the video, which I think, you know, saves a little money and time for everybody. But it also just gives like this like a weird kind of trippy element to it that I think makes the video pop. Then we learned this week that the all-female Japanese band Chai are breaking up and performing their last set of shows in Japan uh, this year. They have dropped four studio albums in the past six years as a group titled Pink, Punk, Wink, and 2023's Chai, all of which had varying blends of dance pop, R&B, synth funk, and electro pop elements. Their message to fans says that they're essentially going in individually new separate directions as musicians. Uh, two of the women in this group are twin sisters, so it'll be interesting to see if they stick together in any creative capacity moving forward, but definitely comes as a surprise. And then you've probably seen or at least heard about the clip of Yasin Bey, formerly known as Most Deaf, on the Cutting Room Floor podcast saying that Drake is basically more pop than hip-hop nowadays. Now, obviously, this is going to make a lot of noise. It was going to cause a lot of debate, and of course, Drake's going to feel a way about it. First, he responded lightly with a story post to IG. This video that he shared is Method Man talking about just how vast and versatile that hip-hop has become. But then also, Drake was in a comment section calling Most Def a crackhead, and so I know there's no love lost here. Like, I think that there's truth to what Most Def is saying about Drake, but that Drake is also right that hip-hop is globalized, and it has become something to a point where spaces of pop and hip-hop are indistinguishable. That is very true. And I think that these two people are looking at the same fact pattern and describing it differently. And I think it's a pretty sore spot for Drake, this idea that he's not hip hop or not hip hop enough, because core hip hop has routinely ostracized and ridiculed Drake over the years and really just kept him at arm's length. Drake is a hip hop head. He is a student of the game. And so it's been very emblematic to watch people like Pusha T like Joe Budden, like most deaf, become his adversaries as he's grown to a point to have and obtain anything and everything he's ever wanted except for that acceptance of hip hop, which he may never get. And I, I do think that that triggers him. We are getting a No Name album in 2024. That is news from No Name. Now, granted, it's just an Instagram story post with no really other details or information. But I do recall her doing her one interview with Eric the Young God after she released Sundial. And I got the sense that she came off as having an appetite for creating more and releasing more music, given that she had just come off a really extended hiatus. And, you know, when you think about it, every project she's released has had some pretty long rollout. I think this could be the first time that she's released an album one year and followed it up with an album in the next year. My hope is we get some more information soon. My hope is that we definitely get this album in 2024. And if I can make a random recommend, sorry, a random request, I would love to see Saba and Smino on this album. K.A. Twigs also dropped off a album update directly to fans, and I like this. Um, she dropped a little information about her upcoming album to her Discord server, which she says is slated for a 2024 release and no details on track list, title, or really much of anything, though she did describe her project as techno-inspired. And then more sad news, Wham! Max is canceling rap shit after two seasons. Part of a small wave of cancellations for the platform, uh, but it's also one of the more relevant shows to get axed. And I think that leaves a lot of fans pretty sour on this. Next up before we go, we got the roundup of albums announced this week that are coming later on in the year. I think by far the biggest is Ariana Grande's Eternal Sunshine is coming out March 8th. Then we got Adrian Lenker of Big Thief, who's dropping an album March 22nd. Then we got here a roundup of the rest of the albums coming in January. It's just one week here, but holy hell, there are a lot of releases here. And then finally, the rest of the albums for the rest of the year. So starting next week, all the way into March, April, May, we have some albums announced this year. And already we're shaping up to have a lot of music coming out. Next week is probably going to be the big first crazy week of the year. And that's all the news that we got for you this week. You've already done us a major solid by watching to the end of this video. And if you want to do one more, click the like button. It'll put us right back in your feed and it'll suggest us to some other people as well. And I'll be right back here again next week. Seeing y'all. So thank you for watching. Peace out. We love you.